webinars to do. We get to come together as a group and share some of our, our tips and questions and introduce you to new parts of SQL. Um, this is our third one, hence the Roman numeral three. And it's always kind of, we've generally have finished up the year right around Thanksgiving doing this webinar. And so we always look forward to suggestions from the our customers for any topics that you'd like to include here. I'm Cheryl Quinlan and I'm the support manager for the SQL group as well as the showcase and the robot teams. Joining me today is a, a big group from the B BI support team and these are the folks that work with you when you reach out to support and they'll introduce themselves kind of as we go through our agenda. We do have a great agenda for you uh, starting with dynamically querying last month's data. We're gonna do some fun date math. We're gonna have a section on using server syntax. Then we're gonna introduce you to the security options that we have available in SQL that you may not know are there. And then we've got a couple, uh, three to be exact, items on scripting. We get a lot of questions about scripting, so we thought we'd dig a little bit deeper into some of these exact examples and show you how to merge documents into an email use conditional logic, and just to review what script views are. We'll have time at the end for questions and answers. And of course, you'll have to chat those questions in. So if they come up as you go along, go ahead and um, chat them and we will have a time at the end to address your questions. And we're going to take it away. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Simone Clark and today I will discuss how to dynamically query last month's data. Next slide please. Um, there are two benefits to using a dynamic query. Um, one would be no manual data entry and the other is an automation option. Next, please. Next slide please. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, um, we can uh, query this data um, by using a date calculation, either via a derived field or using a variable. Next, please. On the left, I have uh, my select clause. Um, in this example, we'll discuss how to use the date calculation via a derived field. So on the left, I have my select clause, which contains the date calculation for the first and last day of the previous month. On the right, I have my thousand fields tab, which contain the derived fields with the two calculations. You can enter these calculations by right-clicking on the field and selecting expression editor. Next, please. In here, we just have a breakdown of the two calculations. Um, for the first day of the previous month, um, this calculation uses the current date function. Um, so I ran this query using today's date. So the calculation would break down um, to current date, which is today is November 10th, minus 10 days, plus one day, minus one month, which will give you the first day of the previous month. The last day calculation um, breaks down to the current date minus 10 days, which will give you the last day of the previous month. Next, please. And here we have our results. On the right, I have October 1st through October 31st. I received these results because I used today's date um, in the current day calculation for this query. Next, please. In my second example, I will discuss uh, the day calculation via a variable. On the right, I have highlighted my red clause, which contains our variables for the first and last day of the previous month. On the left, I have the variables tab. I specified a date type. And for automation purposes, I specified star no prompt, which will prevent our end users from being prompted to enter a date or a numeric value at runtime. And we have the default calculation, uh, which is the same calculation we used in the previous example. I would like to know what automating this particular query, um, you will have to specify the set var parameter when adding to a job scheduler. Next, please. And here we have a closer look at the 
default calculation of the, of the variables we had in the previous slide. Um, it's important that you start your default calculations with SQL. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here we have uh, the results of our calculation. On the right, I have a single column of 31 records, which represents the 31 days in October. And we came to these results because we used today's date in our current ca in our calculation using the current day function. Next slide, please. Here we have our example that uses the date calculation via the WHERE clause. On the left, I've highlighted the WHERE clause, which contains the same calculation as our previous examples. As you can see, we are using the WHERE clause again. However, this time we are not using a variable, which makes it easier to automate this query because it eliminates the need for the set bar parameter. On the right, I have a screenshot of the expression editor of the WHERE clause. Next slide, please. And lastly, I would like to discuss the automation options. Um, depending on your preference, if you're a green screen user, on the left, you can um, either use the IBM I job scheduler or the robot scheduler using the commands I have highlighted here. If you are a viewpoint user, you can access the same automation options, either the IBM job scheduler or the robot job scheduler. However, it is important that you have Robot Schedule installed in your iSeries in order to use these automation options. That's all I have for today. Um, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you. And next I, is Brandy, who is having a little bit of audio trouble, so I'm not sure if she is here or not. I believe I am. Okay, can we can hear okay? you now. Yes. Okay, good, uh -huh. I'm glad. <laughs> that was making me nervous. <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Brandy, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about how you can use server syntax and what that is in your views. So Viewpoint itself has two different options available for you for SQL, what we call star SQL, uh, syntax, which is the basic help systems, or, sorry, Fortra flavor of SQL, and then server syntax, which would change it up just a little bit to use the native DB2 SQL. There are some benefits of using server syntax, um, things like you were able to do multiple join types in a single view. You would have improved functionality if you're using the view template functions. You can use nested subqueries, as well as CTEs or common table expressions. And another big benefit of using server syntax is that your views run without needing the query processor to uh, translate behind the scenes. So it will speed things up just a bit. Now, along with the benefits, of course, there's some challenges. Um, things like some of the functions that you may use, such as that common table expression, uh, would prevent the use of the files and fields tab. And that's really just because there isn't a way to paint, if you will, that syntax through files and fields. Another uh, thing that you want to be aware of is that you're unable to refer to a derived field that you've created by name in another statement. So for example, if you've created a date field, you've used the convert date function, you cannot use the alternate name that you associated with that. You would have to repeat that syntax. You can change your views one at a time to use server syntax, and this is in the view properties. So you would just do file properties, and then on the very bottom left under syntax, you would change it to server. Now you can also make a change to your SQL defaults. So once you make that change, any view that you create from that point forward would use server syntax, and then you can override it if, if at any point um, you should need to. We do recommend 
picking one if possible and trying to stay with it, uh, especially if you're going to be using dashboard type objects. All right, so I'm gonna walk through just a few different examples of things that we can accomplish using server syntax. So this example, the goal here is to create a list of customers with the total number of lines, order lines across all of the orders. To accomplish this, we needed to use a subquery um, in the select statement, or you may know it as being called a nested select. And on this next slide, I'll show you the SQL and what that looks like. So everything that's highlighted is that uh, subquery or that nested select statement. You can see it is called a nested because obviously we have two select statements within this main SQL. And we're just creating that count and you're able to specify a full statement with the from and the where. The next example is to create a running count of the number of customers in each state. Now this function is kind of fun to be honest. It's using a couple of different functions, row number and over to create this count. And you'll see at the example for the SQL that not only do we use row number and over, but also partition. Okay. So we're partitioning by the state and we're ordering by um, descending by the date. So this gives us a list of customers that have their, uh, the state listed by uh, by their date. So we'll see here in a, the example that comes up from the results. And I'm just using the SQL EX data, so you guys can most certainly do this as well. So on the left is the screenshot from that initial SQL statement. So we have our list of states and customer numbers along with their uh, preferred effective dates and the count. Now, if you wanted to return the most recent effective date, you can, you know, by state, you can just add a where clause and use that count equals one. And that'll help narrow down that data. All right, our next example Next slide, please. We should be at example three right now. Oh, shoot, I don't see it. Okay, <laughs> it's not moving forward for me. Don't see the next slide, Cheryl. No, I do. Okay, now we do, okay. Uh, technology gremlins, <laughs> all right. So the next example is the goal of to create a list of customers with their states and their countries. Now for this particular example, the customer master file that we're using doesn't contain a field that defines the country or the nation. So we have to create that and then join on that derived field. So this is an excellent example of how to use a uh, common table expression. And with that, you would use the with function. So the example SQL, you'll see starts with with, and that's how you know you're using a CTE. And then you define a, uh, sorry, a file name, and then define what's going to be in that temporary file. And then you just start with your select statement. So now you'll be able to see in the from statement at the bottom, F1 is being joined, left out or joined to the actual customer master file. Our fourth example, this one to be honest is a lot of fun. <laughs> we use this quite often actually. Um, right now our goal was to create a list of all states serviced by a specific warehouse um, or the way to denormalize your data. So instead of states, it could be uh, compiling a list of patient notes or warehouse logs. So anytime you have um, all of that information in multiple fields, you can use this set of functions. And it would be a CTE, a substring, and then three different XML type functions. 
a little scary, I admit, but it's really not that bad once you get it going the first time. You'll see from the example, again, we start with the width, table expression or our, our temporary file, if you will. And then in the select clause, we're substringing several of those functions together to create that one long string instead of multiple record entries for each state. Okay, so what I would like to do is take you through a real quick live demo, show you how to change the, the syntax using uh, how to use the fetch first, which is a function available to server syntax, and then also how to set up star all. And yes, we sure. can see your screen. Perfect, thank you. You knew what I was gonna say. <laughs> all right, so I have a view open here. I'm just gonna go ahead and display it. Nothing super fancy. I just have a prompt with multiple selections. So I can select one or multiple entries. But what if I wanted to select all? Well, using server syntax, we do have a new and improved way to set that all option. You use the null capable, change that to yes, and you'll notice that we then add the default. Now when you display, not only will you get the options to select one or multiple if you'd like, but now we have the all option as well. So it'll just save you some time from clicking. So we'll see when we display these results, we have 10 records and it's just our summary of sales price by product number. That's great information to have, but maybe you only want to know like the top five products by sales. So at the very bottom of the files and fields tab, click on the fetch first, and then how many rows you want to receive. When you display again, you'll get prompted. I'm just going to leave it at all. And now instead of those multiple records, we have the top five. So in the view, you would do file and properties. And then here at the very bottom, here's that syntax check. Here's that syntax um, setting. Okay, so that concludes that demo and my section. Hopefully I gave you some food for thought and you're excited about trying some native syntax. Hello. My name is Scott Hatch, and I would like to show you how to take advantage of using SQL database security options. Would you like to limit SQL user access to data that does not pertain to them? Why show a sales rep data which isn't their territory? Maybe you don't want certain users to see dollar totals pertaining to customers. SQL provides two security options, data security and advanced database security. This security is set up by viewpoint administrators to restrict SQL users access to libraries, files, rows, and columns. Both advanced database security and database security restrict access to libraries, files and fields. Advanced database security can also restrict access to records and limit star all object profiles access to libraries, files, fields, and records. The best approach is to use only one option. Our recommendation is to use the advanced database security because of the added features it offers. The administrator must have access to the Viewpoint Administrator, which is installed as a custom add-on during the Viewpoint software installation. In Viewpoint, under Tools option, choose Viewpoint Administrator. Choose either the Advanced Database Security or Database Security. If you're restricting a particular user access using advanced database security, you must set the SQL defaults for that user. 
set the design view object authority, checking to star ADS. ADS requires a connection to be set up and referenced in the default database. ADS is divided into three functional tabbed areas. Use the Select by Object tab to create rules and assign them to users. Use the Select by User tab to review the rules that are currently applied to users. Use the Server Options tab to set system-wide global security settings. For our ADS example, we have set up that Scott users should not have access to data from the CUSMAS file sales regions 10, 20, and 30. Under ADS rule securities, you have the ability to set exclude to exclude data access to a library, file, or field for the user. Here I select library SQL EX file cus mass and field region. I can do that, that, but in my example today, I'm going to use row security, which allows filters to be placed on restrictions. For this security rule, I selected field region. The not in condition has been used to not return any records if region has 10, 20, or 30. To apply the rule, click on the rule, then under the user profile choices, select the user profiles that you want to apply to this rule. In this case, Scott user. The profile should have a check next to the box. The server option tab enforces big switches as opposed to security functions on specific users. Options include excluding by default all users to all libraries and all files, apply security to supplemental groups, load security information on demand, enforce advanced data security on star all object profiles. If the application vendor requires user profiles at star all object level, ADS can offer the ability to query at a more limited level and return all libraries or star user library list when returning list of files when creating a view for files. Once you have the advanced database security rule, you can design the view and your user defaults are set to use the ADS security settings. I've created a view using CUSMAS that includes the region field. Displayed results show that the records from sales regions 10, 20, and 30 are not displayed. Only records from sales region 40 and 50 are displayed. Now we go over an example of using database security. Database security is accessed through tools option and then the viewpoint administrator. Database security has access to select by object or select by user tabs. Here we're going to use database security to exclude fields from use. We will exclude Scott user profile from accessing the amount due and payment month fields to use in view creation. Currently, amount due is the first field in the file. Under the select by user, click on the user you wish to limit access to specific fields. I've clicked on Scott user. Under the library file, select the library select the file, and then select the fields that you wish to set the exclusion up for. 
you can go under the select by object tab to verify that Scott user does not have access to the amount due and the payment month fields under the SQL EX CUSMAS file. When Scott user is trying to create a view using CUSMAS, they no longer have access to the amount due or the payment month field. Hopefully these two examples I've shown you has sparked an interest in using advanced database security and database security to facilitate your SQL security needs. If you have any further questions about either the advanced database security or database security, please don't hesitate to reach out to us via phone, email, or chat. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Galiba. I'm a senior technical analyst on the support team, and I'll be spending the next few minutes to look at merging documents into an email. And when I mean documents, these are documents created through SQL, and we're going to use a simple script to tie a couple different steps together to create the output and then send the email. We're in the uh, script, we're going to use the eSend the mail command. And this mail command will generate a mail message. We'll be able to use pre saved files that are on the IFS, like image files. We'll see a JPEG in my example. Um, we'll also be able to attach documents to the email. And of course, those document types can be PDF, text, Excel type files, pretty, many, pretty much any ASCII type file. And again, these files can be created through SQL, saved to the IFS, the integrated file system on the IBMI, and then used in the mail merge process or the mail send process. The interesting thing is we could take an attachment, and you'll see this example, and we could take the results of a view and merge that into the body of the email. So it's not an attachment, but it appears as text in the email, and it's again, the results from your view or your report. And because it is a script, these jobs can be automated and used in a production process and scheduled to run on a, a frequent on a frequency that you need. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in my example, we're going to create two emails. You'll see this happen. We'll switch over to a live demo. The uh, image on the left shows an email message with a with a title or subject that says invoice at the top. There's an attachment called the invoice XLS X. There's, an, there's a header image or a JPEG that's merged into the message body. And then at the bottom, the third element is the view results for a particular view that I ran in the script to generate this email. On the right-hand side, similar concept, attachment, image, and message details. And the point is here, this is just a, a, something I put together, real quick example, but you could use this for any kind of output notifications that you're creating. Okay, and I'm sorry I lost the presentation there, Cheryl. Are we still displaying? And I can't hear anybody? Yes, we are. Uh, now we're at the okay. point of the live demo, so I'm going to uh, pass okay. control to you. All right, I thought there was one more slide there, but uh, let me go ahead and share, and we'll go through the demo. I am ready for that, so, okay, so I have a show my screen prompt here. And do we see a script? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So in, in the examples that we previously um, demonstrated were created through this script. And I am live connected on, into our uh, network. You'll see the script is broken down into two parts. Lines one through 10 will create the first email and the working uh, rows are four, six, and eight. And lines 13 through 17 on the second or the bottom part will create a second email. Using a script, we're tying together our commands and it's just like a macro. So when it runs, we're going to generate 
output for review. That's what the execute command does. If I click on that line, you could see the command resolved into the gray area at the bottom. This first execute will create the Excel attachment. I'm going to save it in the stream file in the temp directory with the name. Second uh, execute creates the uh, text that I want to embed into the message body. And then the third line, the e actual eSend e -send mail command line, <clears throat> takes those documents along with that JPEG image and merges them into a single email transaction. And again, looking at the gray area at the bottom, you can see those parameters specified for the attachment name and uh, the image file, Rosebud JPEG, it's going to be used in the transaction, as well as message detail from this email output that was created by a view and saved to the IFS. Same concept for the second half. And if I go ahead and press the run button, we'll see yellow highlights. It's indicating that the <clears throat> uh, command ran, ran successfully. I didn't get any error messages back. <clears throat> of course, this can be automated as you work through the process. And if I go over to my email inbox, let me pull that into our, our panel here. <clears throat> we'll see that I have two mail messages delivered and if uh, with an attachment we can click on the attachment and open it you can see my notifications coming through also and so here's that uh, uh, excel attachment that was part of the email so real easy uh, simple process creates a script to export data we have static elements like jpeg images that can be merged into the mail message and the nice part is taking view output or reports or tables and displaying that summary or that result set in the message body. And then we have placeholders. So you can intermix text with view results to create some really interesting output. I've seen some real neat stuff for um, survey results, for QA results especially, uh, but, but consider you using this for notices, statuses. You can you can iterate this process so a single email goes to a specific individual or company and then only information for that person or company is in that email. Now you could repetitively run that. That's what I wanted to show you today in our first step into scripting here. I know we're going to stay on that theme and uh, Cheryl is next with her topic. Thank you, everybody. Uh, All right, okay, hopefully, yeah. ho hopefully, um, I'm Cheryl, and hopefully you're looking at my screen that says scripts with conditional logic. Looks good. Thank you. All right. As uh, moving forward with our next example, we're going to dive a little bit into using conditional logic in a script. There's really two ways to go about doing that. One is based upon records retrieved and um, we do have to put them in a file but and, and then query that file but one is based on records and the other is based on user input and we'll look at two examples um first here through our powerpoint and then we'll actually do a, a look at the scripts just as we um just looked at some other scripts when you're testing for records whether records exist or not you often might want to do one thing if the records exist, but then do something else if those records don't exist. We can accomplish that by using a condition SQL function, which is specific to the SQL script. And what that does is if there are records, if it will return a one for a true statement. It will return a zero or false when there are no records. So we do base our condition on that. In this simple example, we've got three views. We have the what I'll call the control view, whatever we're gonna run to determine if there's records. So we take that view one and we send it to a file, just out in QTEMP. Then within the script, we use the condition SQL statement to query that work file. 
And if there's records, we're going to get a one back and it's true. So then we do the next command down and we will display view two. Otherwise, or else, we display view three. We do always need to end our if whenever we use an if condition inside of a SQL script. And that's pretty straightforward. The next example involves a, a prompt from a user. In this scenario, we're going to ask the user at runtime whether they'd like to have a detail report. And if they don't want the detail report, then they want the summary report. My two report commands here look pretty similar. They're actually different uh, just by one letter with a different report name. Both use a date range. And what's important to note is even if you're prompting your user for a variable here for the conditioning, you can still prompt them for criteria to run whatever request you have. And here we're gonna use just the condition statement on the if clause. And based upon what the user keys in for that variable of ampersand U1, they're either gonna key in an N or something other than an N. And that how, is how we're conditionally decide which report will run. And we'll look at this live with our demo. I'm gonna open up viewpoint real quickly here and hopefully you're all seeing my script designer. And this is my first example where I'm basing my condition based on the number of records. So I wanna run a back order report if I have back orders. If I don't have any back orders right now when this request is being run, I just wanna show a summary level of regular orders. So the first thing I have to do is gather my, my, my control, my back orders, and put those out to a file. And I do that on line two with the execute command. And I just select the order number from the order header file where the order type equals B, which is our back order indicator. Now you've noticed I added a little bit extra here. That's because when I'm building this control file, it doesn't matter whether I had one back order or a thousand back orders. I just need to know that there's at least one. And that's why I use the fetch first one row only to build my work file so that I don't have to wait for it to, to create a work file with a thousand back orders. I just needed it if it, there was one. This is in server syntax because that fetch first is server syntax. And I've just decided for clarity's sake to write an SQL statement here. I certainly could have gone into the view designer, built a view and referred to my view here. Then on line three is where I use my condition SQL on my if. And if I say, if I select a one from the back order file, then I'm gonna display my back orders view. Otherwise, I'm gonna display regular orders. So here's a spoiler alert. I have some back orders today. So I'm gonna run this. And when, you, when I run this, you're gonna notice that line four turns yellow because that was the condition that was met. And this is my view that summarizes my products by back order. And if you take a look at the math, um, these really are back order. You know, I, I don't have enough um, supply to meet demand based upon my quantity ordered and shipped. So that's my first example. And I'm gonna switch views and go to my second example, which uses a user prompt. And this is the one that we talked about in a moment ago, where we wanna prompt a user and ask them a question. And, and it could be anything but I've chosen just to, to ask them basically for a yes or a no. And when I run this, you'll notice that I get this question and it says detail report, yes or no. And that's because I have this variable here at line two, which is defined on my variable tab. And this is just this Amper U1 variable. Notice if I key in a yes, which is then a not true statement and I hit to sneak in a little bit older date here to get some records. When I run this, the if condition is not true, so it is running line five. Notice that line five is highlighted. So it's skipped over line three completely, and then now it's showing me my detail report.
Now, if I change the tables here, because if I say my question was, would I like detail? I'm going to add an integrity check. And just kind of as an extra here to point this out, because my condition requires an uppercase N, I want to make sure I take the time to check this entry of uppercase. It'll save a lot of heartache because if my if if I even I keyed in that lowercase n when I go to run this, I wouldn't have gotten a match and it would not have been equal. Because this if condition is nothing different than using criteria on the where clause. It's just regular Boolean logic, and we allow the conditions equal, greater than, less than, but an equal is an equal match. So notice that now when I run this and I say no, even if I keyed in. A lowercase no, it hits uppercase, it now is running line three, and this is a different report showing summary level information. And that's pretty powerful. And I think the sky's the limit here on what you can do with these variables. And we are gonna move right along in our presentation. Hi, I'm Jackie. And I'm going to be talking about and showing you how to use a script view. So a script view combines the multi-step process or power of a script, along with the display abilities of a view. So there's many reasons why you would want to use a script view. It provides a single click output to display you have the ability to join data from multiple data sources. And in SQL Web Interface or SWI, a script view displays just like a regular view with all of your output type options. So a script view does have its own object type, which is SQL SCRV. And when you go to create a script view, you'll notice that there's the SQL script, that's the regular script, circled on the left. So you want to select the one that's circled on the right with the green arrow, the SQL script view. Next. So it's really important to note <clears throat> on a script view, the last line must always be the SC return. And the SC return line is what makes this a script view. It's what allows this object to provide all of the output options that you would normally only see with a view object. So we have two examples here. Our first example is a simple display of results, and you can notice the SC return line. And the second example is similar, but the second example provides, it pulls data from two different data sources and then combines those together for the final SC return line. <clears throat> Next slide. So to see a script view in action, in viewpoint, you could simply double click on it and your results are displayed just like you would with the view or you could right click on a script view to get your output types and options. And in SWI, the SQL web interface, if you have a dashboard, you can place a script view directly on the, the dashboard and it will display the results immediately. And I'll go more into that with the demo. Or you can select a script view outside of a dashboard. Again, with the same output types and options you would normally only see with just a view. I am going to share. And we so can you see your screen. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to look at our first example. So this is a very simple example, but it's important to note that even though in this one, I'm only doing 
one step before my final SC return, you can have multiple steps in here, just like you would in a script, which is part of the beauty of a script view. You can do all of the work that a regular script does and then have your output options like you would with the view. So this one is just creating an out file. And then the last line is that SC return. And that's just going to display the results. <clears throat> so here's my results. And if I go to my second example, this is the example from the slide. And this one is selecting data from a remote database. And it's using that data here, along with a DB2 file, combining them together. So that's the use of the two different data sources that you can do in a script view. Also, if I wanted to just go ahead and display this, I could do display results, or here's those output options that you would see with a view, but this is the script view object I'm right-clicking on. And then I'm going to head on over to SWI, SQL Web Interface. So on a dashboard, these two objects do the same thing. So this is a script view, and this is an action button. And people who are familiar with dashboards know that in order to use a script on a dashboard, you have to add it as an action button. So in order to display the results through a script, I would click on this action button, and I do get results. And notice how these results are displayed. It's a static image, really can't, can't do much here versus the same results displayed with the script view, I can scroll through my records if I wanted to. I have the options, whoops, I have the option of sorting. And even if I maybe wanted to pare this down and not show all of my columns. And it's also a more modern, cleaner looking results than, at least in my opinion, than you would see with just a regular script. So if I get out of the dashboard, here's just the script view standalone. I can right click and here's all the options that you would see only with the view. But it's doing all the work of a script in the background. So that is my presentation on script views. Thanks for watching. Great. And thank you, all of the presenters. Um, we are <laughs> going to now have a time for some questions. And I'm just going to try to make me the presenter again here. And it looks like our topic on the security options within SQL Viewpoint uh, ha has some interest because we have a handful of questions from there. And that was Scott's topic. And one of them is just real straightforward. Does everyone have this ADS security? Yes. It's a matter of creating a connection and setting the user defaults to apply it by user. There's no extra charge for it. It's part of, you might, if you have really, really old SQL version, you won't have it, but um, it, it's been around for maybe about five years. So as long as your version is, is in the ballpark, you'll be good there. Um, when this ADS security is applied, it's limited just to your querying within SQL or, or viewpoint. And so we've had some questions about, would it apply if I was in IBM SQL tools? No. Um, it is it is applied um, at the user default level within our SQL product. 
and will apply to when you design views inside of viewpoint or run views from inside of viewpoint. Um, and we, we'd be happy to kind of reach out to you and um, the folks that are interested in this and you know talk a little bit more in depth. Um, then we had a, a question about commas on no, numerics and dashboards ever been and and that um bill we, we we'll follow up with you this afternoon on that question i don't um have the specifics on that at the moment but we're looking for any other questions and we are approaching kind of the top of the hour and i want to um invite everyone to our next event that we have coming up and oh goodness gracious the the date is not there anymore um, but we do have a webinar on SQL interface, uh, web interface, and that's the interface that Jackie ended with when she was showing you the script views. And that is our browser interface so that you, it gives easy access to your users without having to have Viewpoint installed at the PC level. And it's a really great way if you want um, some users just to run things and not create things. And that, um, I believe, is... November, um, it's mid-November and it'll be on our website and I apologize for not having the date. I think my, my PowerPoint kind of ate it on me. And always know that we're here to help you. You can reach us a variety of ways. Um, all of our emails with the helpsystems.com still work. We'll eventually be transitioning to the Fortra email address. And your link, if you have a link to community.helpsystems.com to go up to our portal, that still works, but we are uh, transitioning that to Fortra as well. And you'll see a lot more green than blue, but we're, we're still the same folks and you can reach us the same way. If you get out to the portal, we will be happy to chat with you. If you want to send us an email, we've got our support.sql at fortra.com or at helpsystems.com. And we always have the telephone. We still really like to talk to our customers and, and we welcome that opportunity to speak with you and, and work through questions and, and any issues. Yes, uh, there was a question. Would you get a recording uh, link to this? Yes, if you even if you just registered and you weren't able to attend, which of course you're not hearing me say that then, but we always send the recording uh, link in an email. It might take a day or two based upon go to webinar, but it will come, I'm sure, by the end of the week. No, today's Thursday. Um, maybe not by the end of the week, but certainly by the by mid next week. All of us want to thank you for joining and we hope you have a great afternoon and please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks everybody. Bye bye.